Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette number 164, where we read and review philosophy papers online. This week, because of uh, in the United States, we're doing philosophy of gender, race, and sexuality. Philosophy of race, mostly. Yeah, we're just doing philosophy of race because of this week. Alright, so, let's see, we're going to take a look at entries, to, not entries, most, recent ad, most recently added items. So, maybe that'll be slightly different. I'm trying to figure out how to do a better search by category or uh, the topic of this uh, thing. I forgot to look earlier. I meant to do that. So this is going to have mixed in with the uh, other sort of things. The uh, gender and sexuality, which I'm, I was just trying to do more race here than those things. But we'll take a look. Okay, so we've got afro lieutenant decolonial, decolonial feminism and dis arrow don't know what that means but hey why not it looks like it might be interesting all right it's not I'm just looking for the uh, philosophy of race stuff today maybe uh, is this a uh... okay so this is I guess a review paper so not just looking for something I can actually argument uh, language I don't speak uh, feminism Maybe I'll do a feminism week too. Learn more about feminism. Uh, teaching about race and sexism in introduction to philosophy classes. That paper we done uh, that was in the uh, APA newsletter wasn't bad. It was pretty good uh, the other day. I mean, what was it this morning? Yeah, it was this one right here. Um, so that was from this morning. I have yet to post it to no, I did post it to YouTube, so it's up now. So people can take a look at it. Let's see what else we got. Genealogies of Terror. Revolution, State, and Violence, Empire. Uh, this looks like a uh, review. Because that's what it seems like. What they're, they've been doing. Okay. Let's go to page two. Oh yeah. Is this here? That'd be cool. Let's see. Uh, you know what, um, so what is this? I don't know. Afro-Latina decolonial de feminism and stereo. I'm not entirely sure what this is, but maybe that's fine. Let's see what this one is. This is probably a review, let's see. It's available. Yeah, it's uh, got an ISBN associated with it, so no. So we'll maybe do that that one I have open already. Does pornography presuppose rape myths? I don't know. Maybe the uh, see what else we got on this page. Love, reason, desire, review, review, divorce, not the topic of the day. Let's see what else we got. Not the topic. Not the topic. Maybe search for race. Um, introduction, review, review, review. Next page. Huh. That's an interesting th thing you're saying there, 50-50. I mean, kind of a waste of a breath, really. No essence life never has made sense, no use to question it. Fuck me. Alright. That's nice. Uh, unfortunately, it seems a little bit, um... I'm not entirely sure what you're trying to get at there, but hey, whatever. We'll get to it if you want to ask about it. No, what is all of this? It's all like these reviews. I don't know. Uh, it's like messages. You get a little banned for being insulting, though. All right. Can I get rid of that box? Is the question. No idea. Mm hmm. All 
Okay, there we go. That's the first successful ban. I've tried to ban people before, but it's not worked. I'm gonna be in, try to be at least a little bit polite. Oh, and they followed me. How nice. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't know. I apologize if you actually want to talk, but like, if you're gonna be a little bit more creative with your uh, opening lines, if you're gonna want, if you want to actually chat. Because it, it, if you were, did, you, you look like a troll. That's the problem. So. Okay, let's see. Crisis, immigrants, refugees. Oh, these guys. Alright, having trouble finding anything, and I don't like it. So we're just going to go with that. Paper that I got. Which is fine. That's cool. Download. So we're going to do this paper by Yomira Figueroa. Yomira? Hmm. Cool. So, if you want to read the paper and you're in the chat room, you can grab the paper link there. Now you can also type exclamation point uh, paper uh, later, and if you put that in the chat, it will pop back up. So you don't have to be here right at the opening to get the paper link. Okay, cool. Here we go, from Hypatia. The first version of this piece was written for the opening panel of the 2017 Conference of the Association for Feminist Ethics and Social Theory, Feast in Florida. The panel, Decolonial Feminism, Theories and Practice, offered the opportunity for black and Latinx feminist philosophers and decolonial scho scholars to consider their arrival to decolonial feminisms, their various points of emergence, and the utility of decolonial politics for liberation movements and organizing. I was preparing to dis discuss some genealogies of U.S. Latina decolonial feminisms with a focus on the relationship of decolonial feminisms to other feminist articulations, for example, a consideration of the relation and divergence between colonial and post-colonial feminism. I was particularly interested in examining some of the de decolonizing constellations of resistance and love created by black, indigenous, Latinx feminisms. I wanted to track the intergenerational labor of re relationality as a part of women of color politics and to discuss how these politics unseat coloniality in its variant iterations. The 2017 Feast Conference took place just a few weeks after Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria tore through the Caribbean and devastated my homeland, Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria in particular ravaged the island's already weakened infrastructure and revealed the existing systems of economic precarity and second-class citizenship endemic to colonies. This natural disaster, or rather colonial disaster, was made deadlier and more destructive due to the local and federal mismanagement and neglect from the U.S. government and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA. Yes, much maligned FEMA, and usually for good reason. Not always. Two weeks post-impact, very little information had emerged from the island as millions of people were left without electricity, potable water, or food. My family scattered across the island was part of those who were unaccounted for or incommunicado. I had been scheduled to attend a literary festival in San Juan, Puerto Rico, Salon Literario Festival de la Palabra, on the heels of the feast conference. However, all plans and possibilities were suspended, ephemeral, deferred. Instead of traveling to the island, I joined the millions of Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, frantically searching for answers, listening in walkie-talkie apps like Zello, and shipping boxes of first aid supplies filled with money, clothes, batteries, formulas, diapers, and non-perishable foods that we knew might never arrive. Sleepless and impassive, my presence at feast and my talk made a different inter intervention than what I had proposed and prepared. Rather than talking about the overlapping arcs of decolonial feminism, I instead meditated on the, inter on the connections I see between women of color feminism and decolonial feminisms as a way to locate some of the contours of Afro-Latina decolonial feminist thought. In, con in contending with the impact of the hurricane, I want to flesh out one suggestive concept for decolonial decolonizing work in diaspor diasporic context that I had been working on for my book manuscript, a term I call desti destiero. I apologize for how I say things. Am I, I speak English in bad English, basically. They tried teaching me Spanish in school, but I didn't really take to it. But I'm less terrible, but I couldn't claim to speak it at all. Afro-Latina decolonial feminisms. 
In her essay, Enrique Dussel's Etica de la Liberación, U.S. Women of Color, Decolonizing Practices and Coalitionary Politics Amidst Difference, Laura Perez argues that decolonizing politics must introduce, engage, and circulate previously unseen, marginalized, and stigmatized notions of spirituality, philosophy, gender, sexuality, art, and any other category of knowledge and existence. A decolonizing politics resides in an embodied practice rooted in living and livable work worldviews or philosophies and is therefore decolonizing relationship to our own bodies and to each other as well as the natural world. The practice of introducing, engaging, and circulating peripheralized knowledge or otro saber, saberes, I mean, other, other knowings, saberes, don't know, is contingent on intellectual and practical generosity. In using the term otro saberes, I am referring to the epistemological break that occurs when devout when devalued or other knowledge comes to be understood and valued as other ways of knowing. At their best, decolonizing projects subvert the ways in which colonial knowledge practices produce hierarchies of knowledge and being that produce oppressive human taxonomies. At their weakest, such liberation projects can fail to see the deeply entangled forms of oppression faced by different groups of people under modern colonial and settler colonial regimes. Thus, not only is it important to center the lived experience and knowledge of those who survive and more after the afterlife of colonialism, slavery, and coloniality, but we must locate one another along our paths of resistance. So I guess the danger here, the author is saying, is um, if you get any of this stuff wrong, you just basically you end up helping the, uh, the old oppressive uh, regime. And if you get it right, it, you, you do well, but if you get it wrong, it's like you've then you've... Uh, sponsored more of the problem so that uh, does seem to be a, it's better than doing nothing but there's always dangers in philosophy so that's one of them uh, Christy Dotson metaphor for this kind of locating suggests we consider oppression as millions of miles of ivy that we all are tasked with pulling down she considers that we cannot see how others miles away are pulling down the ivy, but insists that we must trust and understand that others are also on the task of subverting oppression in conceivably different ways. Indeed, in locating one another and ourselves along varied modes of resistance to oppression, we stay alive. Decolonial feminist thought is located in various temporal and spatial locales. One strand of U.S. queer women of color decolonial feminism, in particular Chicana uh, Latina decolonial feminism, understands modernity as having emerged in the 15th, 15th century with the rise of colonization in the Americas, indigenous dispossession, and the transatlantic slave trade. Framing the modern colonial within these spatiotemporal contexts means that decolonial scholars within the strand understand that the peoples who confronted imperialism and slavery in the long 16th century in the long 16th century represent those on the underside of modernity. Furthermore, Chicana Latina decolonial feminist scholars have made critical corrective, correctives to modern colonial sex gender politics. This includes articulating and centering forms of racialized gender and sexual violence that are endemic to colonialization. One such contribu contribution is Maria Lugones' concept of coloniality of gender. Decolonial feminism thus requires an analysis of rat racialized capitalist gender oppression or the coloniality of gender in order to understand the oppressive import imposition as a complex interaction of economic racializing and gender systems in which every person in the colonial encounter can be found as a lived historical fully described being. I am interested in tracing emerging Afro-Latinx feminist methodologies that exist within and across intersections of diasporic identities, experiences, and politics. I'm empowered by the ways that decolonial feminist ethics recognizes the intersectional subjectivities and lived experiences of women of color as necessary for liberatory practices and the transformation of human sciences and relationality. Perhaps the most challenging and fruitful part of Afro-Latina decolonial feminism is the practice of challenging the colonial difference through the relationality or what Audre Lorde calls relations across difference. I, en I envision U.S. Afro-Latinx decolonial feminist work as embodied knowledge or theory in the flesh that are likewise intellectual, political, and spiritual praxis that bring to the fore the histories, living legacies, and racialized gender dimensions of chattel slavery, diaspora, dispossession, and resistance to these multivalent oppressions. These violent phenomena are always already linked to the histories and 
lived experiences of the indigenous women of Turtle Island and Abiyala, black women across the diaspora and other communities of color under, on the underside of modern colonial project that resist forms of ongoing colonialization. Okay, so this is just kind of set up here. Um, anything? Don't have anything. No, this is just set up. Don't have much to say. I think it's an interesting thing is how do we... Um, I do have a little bit of an, you know, my own interest in this sort of... Uh, the silos of epistemology where you can be off in your corner and somebody else can be off in their corner. You can both be working on similar projects, but you can have, you'll have no idea that you are. What's the um, difference in the... Ep what's the epistemological gap between, um, like, as it, this was saying, millions of miles of ivy? How do you um, figure out how to uh, make things commensurable, actually, what's going on? So that's a problem I happen to be interested in also. So we'll see. A Lifetime Pursuit. The Project of Women of Color Feminisms as articulated by the Combahee River Collective, Audrey Lord, Barbara Smith, Gloria Anzaldua, Anzaldua Sheri Moraga, M. Jackie Alexander, Michelle Cliff, and others is one where relations across difference and complex coalition building are the stepping stones towards fashioning new futures that do not rely on shared understandings of oppression and resistance. And I apologize for how I say everyone's name. In the, their 1978 statement, the Combahee River Collective declared that they not only understood oppressions to be interlocking, but also believed that black feminist thought and political organizing could combat the oppressions faced by all women of color. We are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and we see our, as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that major systems of oppression are interlocking. As black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that all women of color face. This collective of visionary African-American and Afro-Caribbean lesbian feminists articulated politics of relationality that has resounded in the work and organizing of women of color feminists over the last three and a half decades. In her essay, Age, Race, Class, and Sex, Women Redefining Difference, Audre Lorde tells us the future of our earth may depend upon the ability of all women to identify and develop, and develop new definitions of power and new patterns of relating across difference. She argues we have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals, and because of this, we stand to be fractured from one another and ourselves. This project of relations is a lifetime pursuit, one that women of color feminists have kept alive as a politics and a quotidian practice. In using the term quotidian, I'm referring not only to the everyday practices or to home in a domestic sense, but rather I am hailing Tina Camp's articulation of the quotidian as a site of resistance or a practice of refusing the terms of negation and dispossession. Relationality is a method of complex coalition building, of learning one another's histories, and of understanding why difference can fragment communities in search of liberation. My intellectual and political work considers Afro-Latinx diasporas and their varied intersections with other black indigenous and people of color. My commitment to this work stems from my lived experience as a descendant of African indigenous and European peoples and from the experience of being a colonial subject living in the entrails of a settler colonial nation and from the experience of existing on the periphery of several discourses in the academy. It is necessary to continue the difficult conversations about colonialism to reject the settler colonial narratives of belonging and to challenge the ongoing forms of dispossession affecting those who are both citizens and colonial subjects of a settler nation. Yet even, those, yet even with these guiding ethics, questions remain. How do our liberation struggles as Afro-Latinas actively engage with and yet also undermine the struggles of our indigenous and African-American immediate and extended communities? How can we acknowledge and build solidarities and constellations of love and resistance that also bear witness to our collective and respective intergenerational wounds? What are some of the kin wounds that we share and how do we begin to imagine decolonial futures from within and beyond these spaces? All right. Um, if anyone out there has any questions, please ask away. I will try to answer. Like uh, I've said before, this is not my area, so I have less background to draw upon. Um, one question I have here is this concept of a lifetime pursuit. What does that exactly mean um, for us to have a project that goes um, over the... Not necessarily... 
it looks what they're talking about is that it, it's something you do every day as a regular practice over the course of your lives. But I mean, if you're going to call something a lifetime pursuit, then do you have to also structure it in terms of a whole human life, or is it like multi generational? Um, so, what what's the exact uh, limits of lifetime? So we've got some this concepts here I, I don't know enough about. So I like the quotidian. I mean, if you want to do something every day, like a daily practice, like daily prayer, daily workout, daily whatever, that's a, a habitual thing. And um, it's an interesting way that maybe you could reframe that into some a different kind of habit that will make a big difference in terms of politics. Um, but then the other question is, is it going to be some sort of intergenerational? Are these long-term practices that are somehow ingrained into the structure of society and that's why it's lifetime because it goes beyond any particular lifetime so okay questions to be thought about okay it comes with my bones in days of all aki obeya's protagonist explains in english a stereo always converts to exile but it's not quite the same thing exile is exil exilio a state of asylum but Disterio is something else entirely, it's banishment with all its accompanying and input, uh, impotent anguish. Literally, it means uprooted to, to be violently torn from the earth. Excuse me. At feast conference, I chose to discuss the concept of Disterio, Destiero, Destiero, sorry, an untranslatable term from for exile in Spanish, which is akin to being torn from the land because Destiero remains a relevant and precarious condition for black and indigenous peoples. When wrestling with the term, I turn away from its bourgeois underpinnings and instead understand it as a vector of dispossession constitutive of colonial modernity. My point of entrance was Hurricane Maria, which tore through Puerto Rico in September 2017. In effect, a colony of the U.S. for 120 years and Spain for 400 years before that, Puerto Rico has withstood dispossession, genocide, sterilization, diaspora, and recently vulture capitalist intent on collecting an odious debt of $72 billion. Yeah, I mean, it's like many other things at the moment going on in the U.S. is really just not how we've treated Puerto Rico as a country has been very poorly. Um, yeah, I mean, being in New York, there's a bunch of Puerto Ricans here, and you, I remember hearing stories from them about what was going on back there, and it's very terrible. So... There are no more Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. than on the island, and this is yet another process of dispossession by design this is exactly yeah, this is what everyone was saying that it was a uh, money grab a land grab by the uh, rich people you know if you keep people off the land long enough they're going to lose their houses they're going to not going to be able to afford to pay things and then it'll they'll have to uh sell cheap and then give it a two years and everything will be a little bit better and the rich people will then have um all the nice land specular yeah Speculators boast that the effects of the hurricane will further empty the island, leaving more land in American and corporate hands, more Puerto Ricans displaced onto settler lands. Puerto Ricans living in the diaspora contend with multiple forms of colonialism and domination. Second-class citizen, colonial subjects living on indigenous lands in a settler state. This is to say nothing of how Puerto Ricans in the diaspora fall at the bottom of almost all social indexes for education and employment. In light of these political, ide ecological, and visceral realities, I contend that Afro-Latinx decolonial feminisms can help us think through multiple forms of domination and dispossession in diasporic and exilic contexts. Never seen that word before until this paper. Exilic. Interesting. I remember that distiero is a term that can capture the complex and multiple forms of dispossession and the impossibilities of home for Afro and indigenous descended peoples in the modern world. Thinking about about and through Distiero enables us to push decolonial thought further towards liberatory practices and map different forms of dispossession and resistance across inter intersecting identities. Alright, so as far as I can understand this Destiero at the moment, it's more of, since it has to do with uprooting, so you're, instead of being exiled and just like cut off, you're, it's like that would be more like cutting off uh, the tree at the base. That'd be just the exile, you're cutting it off. This is like pulling it out and sort of in some sense the root structure has is still in the is still in the dirt and you still have the root structure so it's like it's sort of like a pulling apart but like everything is still there so you're it's the uprooted and the root and the root space is still there but you've gotten yourself pulled out so it's keeping this sort of tree structure like how you've been uh integrated into the world but in some sense it there's a now there's a gap between uh 
how you are or how the people are and how the world is and they've gotten separated which is um so there's still a dependence there but it's um now there's a gap between it so okay the long durée of colonialism leaves a palimpsest of man i need to be better with words of dispossession and genocide in its wake. If modern capitalism is the accumulation of land, resources, labor to the extent that it enables the accumulation of capital, then the act of tearing peoples away from their land and land-based practices is the precondition of capitalist world systems. Uh, well, if modern capitalism is the accumulation of land, yeah, well, yes. And the precondition of capitalist world systems, particularly as they developed in the 15th century. For indigenous peoples facing genocide and dispossession across the Abiyala and Turtle Island, African slaves forcibly removed from their lands and generations of their descendants, Destiero has undertaken multivalent forms. Imagining Destiero as a palimpsest of overlapping histories, lived experiences, ties to land and land-based practices, and multiple movements, the afterlives of slavery and the migration of dispossessed peoples to dispossessed lands enabled us to become faithful witnesses to the layers and forms of being forcibly ripped from the land while also seeing the resurgence of the land-based practices and resistance to dispossession. Maria Lugones describes faithful witnessing as a political act that is aligned with feminist and decolonial epistemologies and is a method of collaborating with oppressed subjects who are often silenced and ignored. Thus, this decolonial feminist philosophical concept is a strategy through which oppressed peoples form coalitions in order to combat multiple and systematic oppressions. Destiero can be can become a decolonial decolonializing tool if in calling attention to how it is a constitutive part of exile and diaspora, it also focuses on the long legacies of self-determination by peoples on the underside of modernity. Holding that dialectic central to understanding the phenomenological, ontological, and epistemological experience of Destiero is critical if we are concerned with not only documenting suffering but also foregrounding resistance. Black and indigenous ma uh, marinage, literary, poetics, art practices, communal, tribal, and political and cultural organizing, including Idol, No More, No DAPL, Black Lives Matter, St Say Her Name, and the American Indian Movement, the Young Lord or Lords Organization and the Black Panther Party, the Chicano Movement Move and the Black School are some examples of these forms of resistance that emerge amidst and against Destiero. These forms of organizing and activism call to attention some of the structure of Destiero, which often seek to invisibilize themselves through nativist and subtle colonial trappings. On the 2017 album, The Navigator by indie band Hooray for the Riff Raff, lead singer and songwriter Alinda Segar include did two songs, Weekend Bench and Palante, that are political statements about the Puerto Rican history and contemporary struggles for self-determination. The song Rican Bench is particularly poignant in that it underscores ties to land and the generational effects of dispossession of land, language, and cultural practices. In telling a story about colonialism as a necropolitical imposition, Segar underscores the human humanity of Puerto Ricans who've struggled to maintain ties to culture, land, and practices. First they stole our language, then they stole our names, then they stole our things that brought us fame. They, and they stole our neighbors, they stole our streets, they left us to die on Rican Beach. Well, you can take my life, but don't take my home. Baby, it's a solid price. It comes with my bones. The course of Rican Beach reveals a reckoning with the history of theft and dispossession and ends with an expression that underscores how one's life is intimately tied to one's homeland. The lyrics make clear that the theft of a homeland can never be a clean transi transaction for it comes with my bones, rather human material, corporeal, and effective ties to the land. Yeah, yeah so this is sort of a land-based, or is it a place-based, or is it a land-based? I'm trying to understand. I mean, it says land here, but I mean, what what exactly is the ontology of land then? Uh, we have to. I mean, I'm sure it's all tied up together in this, but I'm trying to understand because I like philosophy of place too. Like, what is it to be a place? Is it, it happens in aesthetics, it matters, and then it uh, overlaps here. So, what is a home? What is land? What is that place? Um, so, what exactly is that um, the understanding of the place, uh, the homeland here? Okay. In, in my research, I turned to cultural productions such as this song in order to point to the ways that music can disclose an often unspeakable trauma, grief, and even the intergenerational impacts of dispossession. 
Yeah, this was my question before. Intergenerational places. How, what is that? So that's interesting. Recon Beach offers, little, offers us a way to imagine what it is, means to be torn away from a place and still have your bones, your matter, your body, excuse me, be an essential part of the land scape. Even as sub subjects condemned to destero, dest our bodies remember home. This is particularly powerful in the context of coloniality and ongoing forms of colonialism that require forgetting and erasure. Thus, in time and place, where we are encouraged and even given metaphorical cookies for forgetting, <laughs> it is re rebellion to remember, to tell stories about land and land practices, and to make claims to homelands in the face of dispossession. Likewise, it is heresy to claim that the land remembers you. Rocks hold memory, land holds memory. Warder M. Jackie Alexander tells us, We'll call you by your ancient name, and you will answer because you will not have forgotten. Water always remembers. Enriching our scholarship with artistic and cultural productions that complicate and elucidate the preoccupations and phenomena we study give us, gives us the opportunity to expand our approaches to philosophical inquiry. In fact, the Studia Humanitatis, as discussed by Sylvia Winter, is key to reimagining the human and, as such, literary human humanities and art practices are part of the intellectual and political project of a new science of human systems. Yeah, see, now we're getting into other things. That there is um, some sort of knowledge based in uh, the land and the place. So what is the uh, knowledge of in nature of that place? Because that's kind of what's going on here. All of a sudden now we've got um, m memory and sort of uh, it remembers your name. So there's some sort of knowledge based in that place. And so you're recalling an old knowledge or some other epistemology that is separate from you, but uh, it's a, sort of a location-based. And that's that shows up a bunch of places that you can only remember certain things in certain places. Um, and so why is it and how does that work is always an interesting question. And how can, well, the question here is how is this going to be used to help out the current political system or p current political strife, I should say. A complex understanding of Destiero would be attuned to exile, dispossession of land, removal, contestation, multiple diasporas, and other forms of being torn away from land, land-based practices, and socioeconomic resources. These conditions to which Afro and indigenous descendant peoples are subject are phenomena birthed by modernity and intersect across temporal and spatial planes in such a way that they are intimately tied to the histories and experiences of other people on the underside of coloniality. In order to understand the ontology, ontological impacts of Destiero, it is imperative to have a crit critical and relational understanding of its processes and its impacts in a relational context. The works of women of color, feminist thinkers, are necessary theoretical and practical tools to aid in our understanding of the complexities of Destiero in relational context. That is, their works, political, personal, and poetic, have made clear the stake and difficulties of working in relation to other oppressed peoples more broadly and within our own matrix of relations. Alexander's work, for example, challenges women of color to continue the difficult work of relating across difficult and in particular call uh, across difference and in particular calls attention to the relationships between black women across diaspora. She goes on to ask, what kind of con conversations do we have do we as do we as black women of the diaspora need to have that will end these wasteful errors of recognition? Yeah, so well Okay, it's fine. Keep going. Almost done. It's not a long essay. Alexander argues that people in exile diaspora have grown up to metabolize exile, feeding on its main byproducts, alienation and separation. She asks us to think specifically about the problematic position of being African American and exiled on the spot where one is born. To be Caribbean and exiled on foreign soil, producing a longing so deep that the sight of neglect is reminiscent of beauty. Here she underscores the ontological and phenomenological aspects of being exiled and dispossessed in multi-generational contexts. The consequences of alienation and separation as birthright generate forceful bouts of nostalgia and unwavering longings for home, belonging, and embodiment practices that connect us to the land even amid the potential edificial, political, and social ruins of our homeland. Such forms of destiero necessarily intersect with and are overlaid onto continuous indigenous dispossession and the afterlives of slavery and colonization. Yeah. In these contexts, destiero can be understood as a process of gendered racialization and dehumanization that are contingent on dispossession or tearing away of a person or peoples from land, land-based practices, and epistemologies. 
Leanne Betasamosake Simpson argues that being tied to land also means being tied to an unwritten, unseen history of resistance. For decolonial political projects and discursive anal analyses, this term requires reckoning with the long durée of modern decolonial knowledge systems and a faithful witnessing of how the longing for an act of remembering homelands are acts of resistance. Resistance to Destiero through decolonial land, knowledge, and other embodied practices undermines the process of decoloniality, settler colonialization, neocolonialism that attempts to further sever our connection to land and land-based knowledge and practices. The archive of Destiero can be found in the stories that force us to be faithful witnesses to varying forms of dispossession and divergent forms of and divergent forms of dispossession. My work deeply rooted in the literary poetics of the Afro-Atlantic Hispanophone diasporas reach toward practices of relationality that seek to unsettle the permanence of settler colonialization and to subvert the structural and epistemological forms of ongoing colonialization. Col no, colonization, excuse me. In the diasporic Afro-Atlantic Hispanophone literary and cultural productions that I study, I track how Destiero takes forms as dispossession of spiritual syncretic practices, alienation from the body, refusal of memories, and the physical deprivation of land. Across these works, the act of remembering and awakening the memories of homelands, practices, and resistance to uprooting are tools of resistance against Destiero. This is giving me a some platonic uh, flashbacks, I guess you could say here. Um, and a little flavor of this uh, theory of remembrance is what it is. Uh, back to the Plato, where uh, of course you, you, to know something to, to be able to remember, it, and therefore of course, you, how would you remember something if you've never been there? Uh, it's in the land of the forms. So in some sense, this is, seems like a, uh, a sort of a classical understanding of knowledge, except that your knowledge is uh, located in a place and in some sense you're trying to get, like uh, Plato is trying to get the uh, pure knowledge of forms, you're trying to, um, you can never quite get the pure knowledge of your homeland anymore. So it's sort of a platonic dispossession is the sense I'm getting from uh, this sort of conclusion here. Which is interesting because it is an epistemological theory that's being put forward in this. How can we recover um, the knowledge that in some sense was uh, based in place and time. If you're basing some knowledge in place and time and that is long gone now due to colonialization or other problems, I mean, it, can it be recovered? How will it be recovered? And um, and what is what, what does that um, affect? How does that affect the rest of your knowledge and what does it do to you? And I think that's kind of um, this sort of this uh, like sort of this integrated pulling back or pulling the threads out of like all these things and how that works in some sense is trying to in the uh, Wittgensteinian like walk the fly get the fly out of the fly bo bottle like in some sense you've got yourself stuck in this you're stuck in this trap of c colonialization colonization and you've lost like you're sort of where your world is back out and so you have to somehow walk back the um you have to trace back the route that you came in some sense to be able to understand and bring back some of that old knowledge and uh, abilities that the place gave you when you were, even though you were not there anymore and you were sort of lost the way back. Um, so this is an interesting sort of way about going about this. It, it's sort of platonic in one sense and non-platonic in another because uh, it, it's a, uh, in the Wittgensteinian sort of uh, Philosophy as a uh, remedy, sort of you're trying to remedy the problems here. So you're trying to draw upon all these sort of like roots back, but uh, you've been like, you've been physically thrown, like taken out of the place, you've been thrown into the fly bottle, and now you try to find different roots home, um, where there, there really is no more home, or, or at least there won't be uh, now. So, but even the roots back are enough to uh, resist like the uh, current state of the world. Okay, so the question is, how do you go about the sort of that sort of epistemology? And that's an interesting question here because if you have an epistemology of place and the sort of walking back in the Wittgensteinian sense of you have to like show the fly out of the fly bottle, you've gotten yourself into a uh, colonial trap, not like a language trap in the Wittgensteinian sense, but you've gotten yourself into a uh, 
a decolonialization de trap of, and a way of thinking according to the colonizers. How do you get yourself out of that? And so, I don't know. But it's an interesting way about going about this sort of thing. The, this sort of uh, Wittgensteinian going back, even though there is no land anymore in the platonic sense. Like, there is no world where the forms, there is no home you can go back to. You can't go home. World's moved on. But uh, the epistemology you get from understanding how you got there and how you could go back if there was a way back um, resists the, the like it it, it uh, fights against the understand like the sort of the flyball that you got you're now trapped in the colonial flyball. Okay, so that's the best I can make sense of it at the moment. If anyone has questions, try to watch your language, please. Um, there's no need to curse. If you're gonna be, cur if you, if, well, well, if you want to say something rude, you better be very creative about it. I don't actually mind uh, people being uh, rude if you're just if you do it in a very creative way. And cursing generally is very cheap. I mean, it's not hard to write words. It's hard to write a good sentence though. Yeah, and speaking of, this was pretty well written too. So, yeah, so embodied knowledge theories in the flesh. So how exactly these yeah how exactly are the legacies going to be uh, motivated and used to get back to uh, some sort of different kind of knowledge? All right, so that's it for now. Um, I guess I'll be back tomorrow morning with another paper. Have a good night, and if anyone has any questions, now is your last chance to ask. Otherwise, stay safe out there, everyone. Please have a good night.